So good afternoon, Mr. Kanpothai, and thank you so much for granting us the opportunity to interview Sir here in the province of Siem Reap, Sir. Uh, sir, you have been uh, a tour guide and a specialized one for many decades now. Um, you have also uh, do a lot of restoration on the temples and uh, you also have been in filmmaking with TV and uh, you know, documentary team, sir. Uh, sir, uh, my first question to you is that um, because you have traveled, you have welcomed and you know, uh, toured a lot of foreigners for many years. Uh, simple question, sir. When, when you see them coming to Siem Reap, you know, the first time that they travel through, let's say, the, the road in front of Angkor Wat, they climb up the causeway bridge, they cross the cruciforms, uh, platform structure. Um, what is their first impression, sir, across the nationality, let's say? What, what do they feel when they see Angkor Wat for the first time? Well, I think uh, the Angkor Wat is the most famous temple, as you know, um, for anyone who ever loved the history, science and so on. Uh, the impression of coming to Angkor Wat is, you know, you've seen this great, magnificent building uh, and then the impression of having like these towers, the, the stone structures and, um, you know, uh, walking through the causeways, you can explain that this is the world masterpiece, the art, the Hinduism uh, and then Buddhism and so on. So you have a lot of things to see with them. Uh, including uh, engineering, uh, you know, and also something like, you know, the science, for example, you know, the solar system, the lunar system. And uh, as well as uh, the great Khmer history empires. I mean, uh, how is one civilization that used to be uh, one of the largest in the world. You know, the city of Angkor or the Khmer Empire, it was probably the largest uh, empire outside of China for Asia. Uh, one of the greatest empire of the world. And then in almost like, you know, through three, four hundred years, it disappeared quickly. Uh, you know, there's still the mysteries of why this whole city was abandoned, you know, uh, and how uh, it's been rediscovered. And uh, there's a lot of debates about, you know, from archaeological standpoint, from uh, many explorers' standpoint, to really understand how they able to recover Rediscover Angkor, for example. The rediscover in what way, sir? Like it, how it, it means it's it, it came out from the jungle. I mean, the jungle mm. took over the whole complex for nearly 600 years. Yes, sir. And then uh, the first Europeans came. The you know the French and all those came, and then uh, they started to find out that this building it belonged to one of the greatest empire on mm. earth. And then from then, you know, the friends have been working on the building. And then, you know, in the uh, 30, the 40 and 50, uh, and then it became famous. And now, you know, uh, the world just really talk about, if you talk about this greatest building on, on earth, talking from the pyramid, the Great Wall of China, and uh, to, you know, the Peru, for example, Machu Picchu. Uh, Machu Picchu. And then Angkor Wat, it's one of those in the list. So for mm. some people who like to travel the world, Angkor Wat is definitely one of their, their uh, must uh, see yeah, one of their must see uh, in architecture, history, anything you could say about Angkor Wat. So no wonder that when they get to this building, it's, mm. it's like their dream coming true, you know. Yes, sir. But as such as a you know small question, you know, um, you know, like let's say twenty years ago, there were very less internet access, maybe in Cambodia or yeah. maybe a lot, you know, also uh, in the world, and now there are more internet access. Yeah. So, uh, is it 
true that you know people before you know they they don't really see uncle on the internet and then when they come to uncle they are so surprised and you know maybe now people see uncle more often on the internet and then when you see their face they come here do yeah. they feel less surprised yeah. or they no, feel surprised all the time i think you know we we're looking at the the tourists who are over 60 80 years old now uh, elderly uh, tourists they've seen the the pictures of Enco on National Geographic magazine mm. since they were little, since they were kids, oh. uh, in their school, in their classroom, whatsoever. So they aim so to they visit, aim to visit yeah. Enco, uh for a long yeah. time. Mm. And when they arrived, they said, I saw this on the magazine since I was 18 years old, 20 years old, you know. Uh, now for them, it's their dream come true. Mm. From most young people now, they've seen pictures all over about Angkor Wat on the internet and so on. They're still impressed because Angkor Wat, it's, it's uh, the building that you cannot put it right on paper. You cannot you put it, even though it, the internet yes. and stuff, but you really have to see it to believe it. Mm. That this building, it's, it's huge. It's a great masterpiece. Uh, very impressive. I mean, we see those every day. You, we may not think that it's a wow. For them, it's a wow. You know, uh, when you get the scale of the building, when you see all the work involved mm. onto the bus relief carving, for example, one of those panels, how many people would have in, been involved in working on the, you know, to make all of those in within 34, 35 years of work. So how many people would have been involved into the into to this building, yes. uh, you know, from for 34 years, 35 years, uh, under one lifetime of the king. So there must have been thousands of people working. Specialists. Yeah, yeah. specialists, craftsmanship, so, yeah. and so on. Uh, and then uh, the ordinary workers and, you know, from all over the empire uh, came to build this, this great building. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, because uh, Angkor is uh, considered a living heritage, not only the temples, not only the stone, but also the people, the way of life, uh, you know, across generations, their customs, their tradition, uh, culture, especially seasonal culture, uh, and also, you know, very, very, let's say, uh, not mysterious, but less uh, known activity in the village. So, sir, uh, you know, between temples, uh, what else do you bring to the visitors? Let's say, do you bring them to see, you know, uh, how they grill the fish, or maybe how they catch the fish, how they cook, you know, how they brew the sugar? What yeah. is beyond the, Angkor, sir? Inside the Angkor complex, as well as the surrounding area, yes, sir. there was still life of people living in there. Mm. And this life style, including traditional culture, funerals, and so on, and uh, it's part of the living heritage to Angkor, which is why UNESCO put Angkor to be a living heritage site. So there's still people living next to the, the temple. So for the tourists, when they're visiting the temple, uh, after that, they would travel around somewhere. We always want to show them, you know, part of their lifestyle. Uh, sometime in the harvest season, they harvest rice, mm. uh, they transplant the rice, yes. they you know, collect the palm sugar from the palm tree uh, and weaving basket. Uh, those activities, it's, it's uh, uniquely Khmer or uh, part of their daily life. So that, that is what the foreigners want to see? So. Yeah, we have to include part of the life mm. into not just seeing the temple, but people who live around this heritage also would be part of it. So uh, there's something about the, uh, uh, <clears throat> let's say the way of life, uh, as I mentioned, including some of the natures as well. Uh, people interested like in bird watching, for example, mm. uh, people who, uh, uh, now we, we, I mean, some people even interested on insect. Like termite yeah, mounds, something yeah, the like termite that. mounds, yeah. the the uh, the spider mm. and ants and something they're interested in, yeah, yes. cicada, cicada and so on. So, uh, 
uh, <clears throat> livelihood uh, plus culture. Sometimes we stop at the funeral, for example. Oh, you, you uh, also stop at yeah. the funeral uh, just there, to let there's people something see. see oh. I mean, something on the street. Mm. Uh, I'm sure all the tour guys know that <clears throat> this is something they wanted to show them. Uh, there's some Buddhist ceremony. <clears throat> there's some funeral because people wanted to see that how mm. people people when people die what they're going to do with that so mm. you have to show them that this is how they people do they bury it so they cremate it you explain the whole thing uh, so that was one one part of that and uh, the other part i think uh, it's involved with like wood carving stone carving uh, which is some of the village inside the park they still do the traditional wood carving yes, and stone carving as well so but you also mentioned about the bird watching at Ong Koh Thom in closed cities or maybe the bat you know at the Phnom Krom tower you know they they move in and out yeah something like that the um, I think you know the, there's a a few location inside Angkor mm. that people could do a bird watching uh, such as on the top of the wall of Angkor Thom and also uh, around the northern Barai uh, and then sometime at the west Barai uh, mm. as well. And for you mentioned about the, the bat uh, from the towers of Phnom Krom, that's also possible. But I think it's really depending on the, the, uh, the interest of, of the, the tourists. Tourist, yes. Uh, some interested on different things, some interested in just looking at the temple and study the architectures, the engineering mm -hmm. and all in detail. And some like to see something else around the temple. Some also interested in nature, bird watching. So it's really we have to give them the, the product of what we have. And then they're the one who make the decision whether they want to go, they want to do it or not. You know. Yes, sir. Yeah. Is there any, you know, noticeable or, you know, is there any, uh, you know, differentiation that you can make between different nationalities? So, for example, um, let's say geographically, I think um, tourists from China, tourists from Vietnam, Thailand, or something like that, they have similar geography to Cambodia, or maybe people from the Western world or the European countries. They might have different feeling on Cambodia's uh, geography and also culture, sir. So, is there anything that you can differentiate between nationalities sir, on what they want and uh, on what they hope to learn yeah. from from uncle, sir? I think for Asian culture, we are quite similar between yes, like Thailand and uh, around in Asia, for example. So their main focus is just visiting the temple. Mm. And maybe going to the Tunle Sap Lake, taking a boat to see the way of life, living yes, on the water. Okay, uh, that is specifically for Asian uh, tourists. And then for people from China, of course, they like to see the temple. They also like to do the different product, including their shoppings, including mm. their. They still going to the lake Tunle Sap, maybe just for photograph and all to see different things. They not take it so much serious uh, compared to European, compared to the uh, American, uh, that they were focusing on archaeology, on the you know, history, and also uh, the details of the temple and culture, including you know, the way of life uh, of people living around the lake, for example. Uh, so those are the, something that uh, they, they will have a bit more of, of uh, expectation. Yes, and they were, for them, their fresh eye to see the Asian culture. But for example, European countries, uh, they have never seen a buffalo before and they want to see water buffalo or something like that. Sir. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, yes, that, that's, that's yeah. a different culture between, mm. I mean, different landscape, different animal, different things so they wanted to see I mean it's, they will see the, the animal and they would say what is that you know mm. a cow or buffalo or something like that so uh, for Asian countries you know there were buffalo in Thailand there were water buffalo in so it's Vietnam not surprising so to it's them, not yeah. so surprising yeah but for European yeah uh, population yeah this place is quite new to them so exactly um, 
for the tour guides, it seems like there's a group of tour guides working for specifically European and American. And there are tour guides working, speak, for example, Thai, they would just take the Thai tourists. So they know what the Thai people would want, what the Vietnamese people would want. And there's a tour guide who speak Japanese. They know what the Japanese like to do. There's tour guides who speak different language in Europe, Germans and others. They know exactly. They have, they've been in that field for a long time. So they really understand the mentality of the tourists. Yes, so they, like myself, I work a lot with American and the British and sometimes for the Australian. So mainly English speaking people. So we understand that what they would like to see, to do. And, you know, it's a different perspective. And uh, so each of tour yes. guys specialize in different things. So like you mentioned uh, just now, um, the Japanese people, they need to see the sunrise. Is it because uh, they have the sun on their flag, something like that? Sir? I it's think it's symbolizing their culture. It's became the culture for oh. for the Japanese tourists yeah. that they wanted to see early suns coming mm -hmm. out from many different famous places in the world. So coming to Angkor Wat, why not going to see the sunrise? Mm -hmm. Because it's part of their, their culture. uh, cultures and imagination of having the suns coming out behind this great building. Towers. Yeah, sir. the towers. So they wanted to do photograph as well. So they famous photograph of reflections uh, of the sunrise in the water and uh, with the, you know, unique ankle what behind. So they wanted to see it. And now you see uh, Europeans also going there and uh, other Americans are also going there. Mm. But to mostly younger people who are going there for sunrise. Yes, uh, you have very few percents, like maybe 10, 15 percent, those who are like over 50 or 60 years old. Uh, those, you know, they don't like to get up, get up so early, <laughs> like 4.30, yeah, yeah. going there and 5 o'clock, 5.15, 5.30, the sun coming out and then 6.30 coming back to the hotel, you know, do the breakfast and stuff and going back again. Sometimes it's a big long day for them. but. Mm. We always try to promote, you know, people. When you do the itinerary, you always have those options for them to do sunrise or not. And the sunset, it's something that most Europeans do the sunset because they like the color. They like the, you know, they're going up the Phnom Bakang, even though it's crowded, a lot of Asian as well. They see it beautiful because of the sun and the color waters and so on. And they went up to this temple if they have the energy. But the other place that for sunset, for example, on Angkor Wat, yes, there's also beautiful for sunset, but it just, uh, the authority closed too soon, like 5.30 in sunset, like 6.45, 6 o'clock. Mm. So they can't really stay there inside to see the color chain, the towers, you know, from the sunset when it's setting. And then you have the color of the sun change the color of the stone. They can't be there after 5.30, they have to be outside at the moat. So sometimes I think the authority need to reconsider to find a different time Maybe of the year is to it close Kram. it. Phnom Kram is also a good place for sunset now so because it reflects yeah. on the rice paddy. I mean, uh, exactly. I mean, sunset can be anywhere yes, uh, on that rice paddy, but it's not Angkor Wat, you see. Mm. So they want to have like a beautiful structure with the color of the gold on the building. Because when you go for sunrise, you don't get the gold color on the towers. You mm. get the gold color on the sky. Yes, yes, and sir. then you get the, the towers the with silhouette, quite silhouette, silhouette background. Yeah, your background. background. I mean, then the gold color. But with the sunset, you have the sun, the facing, light, change the, the towers, tower, yeah. facing the, to the, the main towers. So it changed the color to like a golden color. So for photograph, uh, you know, sun, sunset that I call what, sometimes it's just beautiful. Uh, yes, change the whole things to gold. It's like a golden building. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, again, sir, because Sibirip is very, very big, even though Cambodian people don't know Sibirip at its entirety, sir. Um, archaeologically, let's say, when we try to traverse the temples in Sibirip, the most important route is the the, the grand circuit and the small circuit. 
but it does not encompass the entire you know archaeological park so and um there are so many smaller temples yeah uh Yom, for example in in west barai or let's say uh prasad uh you know Premunti in in bakong uh, region so how do we try to promote this smaller temple so and even the, you know to the west of the west barai yeah. there are so many smaller temples made from yeah. brick uh how do we promote that and again so you know when we say that okay we want to promote that some people say oh we don't have enough time and you know it's still further away so it's not really feasible in terms of logistics so we want to promote but again it's hard so how do you balance that sir i mean the the main schedule in angkor basically you try to do it in three days oh okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, visiting the main temple and then on day one and then some other famous temple like Bante Sri Beng Melia, all those on day two. Mm. The rest of that, you also wanted to see if there are people interested in remote area, remote temple, including some of the temple that really visited by the tourists. So for example, like Prasad Bante Tom, which is uh, northwest of Angkor, I mean, the Angkor Tom complex, and this is Bante Tom. Sometimes it's surprised when people hear that. Where's Bante Tom? Most people don't really see it. I mean, never heard the name of it as well. So uh, there's a small road getting there. Yes, sir. Uh, and it's peaceful. It's, you go there, you don't see any other tourists. It's like you going there, you have the whole place for yourself. And then the, the building also, it's still in the jungle. It's, it, uh, you find its uh, tranquility and the authentic. I mean, the reason why these temples are not really visited, is it because the tourists do not want to come or is it we ourselves does not, we do not promote it to, uh, to the tourists? It's two things. One is people don't have enough time. Yes, sir. So most people spend one day or two day inside in, Angkor. So it's very limited so for them. So they already. really wanted to see the main temple. Mm. Okay. And two, the access to the temple the road going there, you only go in there with a small car or you go in there by the Tok Tok. And it's sometimes the wet season, you can't go there at all. It's just mm. flooded. So as the Cambodian Apsara Authority, they should consider of opening up the road to get to some of the smaller temple. So that increased the day for people to visit. Mm. You know, yes. so uh, Prasad Monte Tom and also like Pre Munti in, in, the, in Rolus group, there are also the roads there, but the road you can't really drive into it. Yeah, I yeah. took uh, my client uh, in last week and I went there, and then there was no road. So it's like you all, get to walk through the bushes. You yeah. can't even walk because it's oh, flooded, it's and flooded, it's okay. you know only the <laughs> ox cart. Oh. Uh, people yeah. riding ox carts coming out of that temple, but sometimes. Yeah. You know, the tourists want to see that, take the pictures of the ox cart in, in the jungle. It's like it went back to like a hundred years ago yeah. that they, you know, without the car and all those, so they see the authentic thing. So some of the small temple Apsara need to really do something mm. to get access to some remote temple. So normally when, you know, when tourists have the chance to visit those smaller temple, they do not feel disappointed. They actually feel unique because they have been somewhere that you know not many people have exactly to, to, gone through before exactly they feels like they have the whole place the whole temple for yeah, themselves yeah, yeah, yeah. they felt like uh, the temple it's just being rediscovered mm. and uh, they feel something special to see this small one of course you have to show them the big one the most highlights yes, like Angkor Wat Angkor Tom Bante Sri Taprom and all those with giant tree but the small ones also has its uniques as well, you know. Yes, sir. Yeah. And at the same time, sir, because, um, you know, based on uh, a few interviews that my team have done, we, you know, expert, especially from the ICC, the uh, International Coordinating Committee of Hong Kong, they bring up like a philosophical idea that the stones are speaking you know, the stone is not just a stone, it has a feeling, uh, you know, an emotion. 
it's like uh, the soul of our ancestors. You know, they moved it here, they put it, they sculpted it. Uh, do you often transfer that philosophical idea to the tourists or not? So when they come here, and can the tourists feel it if you were to transfer it to them, sir? Yeah, I think you know, uh, we, we, as a tour guides, we're walking through the temple, for example. You always stop to explain, mm. right? You're explaining from the carving, like the head of the Naga, the snake, why there's a snake, and the whole things about this mythology of Naga. And then you explain if there's any carving on the stone, uh, including some of the bas relief on the stone as well. You explain how they cut the stone, how they transported the stone, and how mm. they built to the temple, putting together so tight, incredibly tight that even you know, no water can even go through it. it. Yes. So it's very, very uh, talented skill that they've done to the stone. So the way we explain about the stone on and on throughout the whole temple, and that make the whole story, that make the whole history of the place became alive. So people use, I always say to people, use your imagination to understand the past because Angkor, but you see, it's not really seeing the carving, seeing all of these temples. Back in those days... It's what behind the yeah, story. Yeah, back in yes, those sir. days, you have the color on the towers mm. painted in gold, this bas relief work in color, the wooden painted, ceiling. and the wooden ceiling, ceiling on yes, top, sir. there's a wooden door. So you have to use your imagination to understand the past. Because, like, for example, you get to the gallery of the temple, you have all the, just the pedestal mm. of the statue, but the statue is gone. Yes. Why? Because it's been looted, it's been stolen, it's been destroyed throughout the wars and so on. So there used to be statue all along the gallery, for example. There used to be yeah. this wooden ceiling, there used to be a wooden door. So it's, it's something more than what you see. And the only way you could tell that is because of the stone. There's a hole there, mm. used to be the door. You know, you see the evidence there. So like, that's like why a, the stone is speaking. The road leading to the Prasad Prang in Kokke, there are like statues on either side, sir. Like yeah. the statue of Prechan or something, Chandra, yeah. something like that. Yeah. So it's so, all gone, only the pedestal. Exactly. Yes. So to some place like in Kokke Temple, yes. you have to bring the pictures to show mm. people. When you get there, you only see the pedestal, you only see part of the broken statue. But what it used to be like, there's an old photograph of the French took before the war. There's a computerized uh, simulation of what it used to look like with all yes, the sir. gods sitting there, Dancing sitting Shiva. there with this, yeah. Yes, so all those things that you can see with them to reflect what the temple used to be like. And uh, so, in terms of the stone is speaking, I think it's correct because you can tell anything about the stone. Mm. You can tell the whole history of the place and use your imagination to understand what it was like in the past. I mean, the, the, uh, when they see this building, they would say how, how they did that in the first place. Right? Okay. How they got the idea of building the temple. The design. The, the design. The blueprint, so yeah. you have to explain about the, the influence of the Hindu temple in India. There's a way that this culture communicated with the Indian culture. They would have traveled by boats to India to study the history and architect. I mean, the, the, the Hinduism and the architecture there. And then they came here. They were advisors to the king, they passed on the knowledge, and the king became, for example, like the god king, that the king must do three things when they came to power. One is building the palace, building the reservoir, and building the temple. I so see. the temple, wow. palace, and uh, the reservoir, the water. So these are three most important things that they must do to keep their powers, to keep the, uh, you know, the reservoir, the water, it's to irrigate the rice paddy and uh, they're able to, to do a lot of rice crops and supplies of food and so on. Yes, so uh, to keep the economy strong.
right? So they learn the architecture and pass on. The priest would say, this is what your temple looked like. But you put all the temple together from a smaller one to with one tower to a, a bigger one with three towers on one platform. And then it went up to five towers on a pyramid shape. And it went up to a bigger temple with the gallery all around and five towers on the top. And then it, it went all the way to Angkor Wat. So the architectural evolution, it actually started from, you know, ninth century, for example, 9, 10, 11, and 12. So 400 years of, of, of ev the evolution, uh, evolution of architecture to get to yes. Angkor Wat. So it's not just like somebody mm. came in and said, let's build this giant building. No, you have to really get the smaller one and develop it to be bigger one and bigger and bigger and bigger until more, you get this. Yeah, yeah. More they follow the rule of building the temple. They follow the uh, what the element inside the temple that they must do. Uh, the the uh, the gallery for the god, for example, this the flame, how the sacrifice, how mm. and all those until you know they get the tower with the home of the god there. So it's used for purely ceremonial purpose, yes, not sir. for the king to live there. So only they, they come to do ceremony. One archaeological expert, he said that his name is Asidin Beshaush, I think you know him. He said that Angkor is a place to visit and revisit, sir. And across the years that you have been working as a tour guide, do you often receive tourists that come again? And what is the, the, the purpose of their revisitation, so let's say, and, um, and at the same time, how do you let them come again and again, sir? Because, yeah. Um, I have a lot of tourists that have been visiting one time, two time, including seven trips coming back to Angkor. <laughs> wow, and they're still God. on my waiting list now with three families who wanted to visit later this year or so next year. The first visit, it gives them the introduction to the temple. Mm -hmm. Even though you try to tell them everything, but they still feel like it's not enough. They mm -hmm. wanted to come back, they wanted to learn more, they wanted to see the other sites as well. So each year we have uh, what they didn't do, what they like to do next, or like to do it again. So we always discuss that you already visited this, you still want to visit Angkor Wat, you still want to visit this or not. So you give them a whole itinerary and then you have a place like Koke mm. that just many years not possible to go there uh, because of the roads, because of the civil war and so on in the 90 and the early 2000, for example. So now you can go there and they learn about the statue that been looted from the temple there. And now it returns back. They wanted to see the place. They wanted to see the temple there. OK, so we have Previ here as well. So the trips, like the last time they've been here, we did not, you know, propose. They proposed, but they're not enough times, you know, three days or something. So they want to do Brevi here. Then we go into Brevi here. And then they wanted to do like Sambo Prikup in Kampong Thom. Then we yes. included that. So we always oh. give them a options of what we have and they choose to do or redo it, you know. So I have quite a number of people who visit it again and again. Just to learn about the new things in Cambodia. They wanted so. to see more and they wanted to, uh, they feel like it's a special place to come and bring their family to see. And uh, they even bring their parents, their children on the second trip, the third trips. And, uh, and then the way they learn from people like myself explain to them. So it's really like, a special place to understand what was going on a thousand years ago in that place. Yes, sir. Yeah. And because you are also a filmmaker, uh, you know, you have been working with National Geographic. Uh, sir, do you think that uh, Angkor or the region of Angkor is exposed enough on documentary, you know, let's say society? And do you want, you know, more Cambodian people to make more documentary for ourselves? not to rely on you know, the foreign... I think yeah. we. Uh, I have done the work for the National Geographic. I've done the work for the BBC. Yes, uh, we And then the other channels as well. Uh, in many 
his story of Angkor, the lost empire, the lost temple, the lost whatever. There's so many, but those big program, it's always a good uh, promotion, a good opening eyes to the world. Yeah, uh, I know there have been one very successful I've done in 2014 for the, for the BBC and then it's sold to the Smithsonian's and other mm. people saw that documentary, it's well done about the LiDAR, the scan, yeah, what yeah, the yeah. city would look like. We were the first to do it in uh, 2014 and that bring a lot of tourists to come to Angkor. So I think for international filmmaker, documentary filmmaker, they like to do in Angkor, but there was sometime our authority, like Apsara authority, should reconsider in giving them like a, a special uh, uh, promotion, yeah, special okay. rate, encourage them to come and do more. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a program, it's like on CNN, uh, I was in it, CNN goes. Uh, they've done something like that for traveling, you know, so that's we should open more for the international We also should encourage more for the local uh, filming industry to do some more documentation uh, I think uh, Of course, we don't have local we don't have the budget uh, a lot to do all those kind of detail but we should encourage some young people with the idea of doing a small specific yeah. Like high quality of documentary 10 minutes 20 yeah. minutes something yeah. like that sir. 40 yeah. minutes i mean the 45 minute 90 minute documentary it's possible but we don't have a big market uh, of doing that now so we're we gonna sell it to put it on youtube put it on facebook that's really not much so yeah. if there's a big tv uh, channel in cambodia also help to promote something like that yes, to sir. encourage some young filmmaker to do documentary on the temple documentary on the wildlife in Angkor. Mm -hmm. I have a new project coming is doing about the insect in Angkor. Mm -hmm. So it's always something possible in Angkor that I think the authority, Apsara authority should encourage and open more for people who want to do something like that because we can't really keep it. We have we have a lot of things inside, but we, yes, we don't really want to let them do it and want to let them know. So it's like, you know, you're having all the wealth, but you don't spend it. You don't yes, really show uh, it to, so to, to, the, to, world, the, yeah. to the world. Yeah. Yes, yeah. sir. And my last question, sir. You are a specialized tour guide, sir. Uh, you have also worked at uh, the World Monument Fund. Uh, currently, uh, you know, they also restore a lot of temples in Sibrip. Uh, what is the difference between, you know, let's say an ordinary tour guide and a specialized tour guide, sir? And uh, when, when should people, you know, contact an ordinary tour guide and when should they contact a specialized tour guide? Um, I used to work for World Monument Funds in the year 2000 till 2004. Uh, for nearly five years. Uh, we're working on the restorations on Angkor Wat at Brek Khan and Ta Som. And then they went on to work at Phnom Bakang. Uh, I left the job when they were there. And then I, throughout this job, I learned a lot about the restoration, conservation work, and then, then some technical term of building, for example. You know, you understand all in detail and then you were involved in the community that doing all the conservation restoration. So you understand more about how they are fixing the building and the whole philosophy behind, including those technical meeting in the ICC, mm -hmm. you know, International Coordinating Committee that all these international countries came in to do all the restoration conservation work, right? Yes, sir. And you also study archeology span throughout the temple that you learn uh, and then, uh, so you get quite a wealth of knowledge that uh, the other two guys also have a wealth of knowledge as well, but you have something special sometimes mm -hmm. that you want to share with the people. So because of my experience for a long time in the park, and I really know what I'm talking about in the temple, uh, and that put me into a, a very 
a specialized tour guide or the archaeo tour guide, which you can explain about archaeology, right? So uh, uh, the ordinary tour guide, we all learn the same thing, mm -hmm. but it's just one, of course, we more experienced, right. and one is just less experienced, and one knows something more special. So we could really, you know, uh, explain uh, to the different. Uh, I mean, you explain uh, the same material, yes, sir. but the way you explain it's more it's, intricate. It's yeah, more, intricate. Yeah. Yes, sir. Then the other would just say, this is an apple. And, yeah. uh, you know, mm. but w w you would say, this is an apple with the mm. skin of apple, with the seed inside the apple, and everything. Yeah. You know, so uh, that just, uh, it, it's also so the love that you have for the building. It's, mm. People can see that, you know. In, how, in, your, in your facial expression. Yeah, your, in the, yeah. your heart, in your facial expression. Mm. The, it's like you and the stone, myself and the stone, were all connected. And people could see that, so they always feel like, okay, I, I came to Angkor Wat, I met this guy who was really talented and understanding the architectures, the history of the building, the archaeology of the building and so on. So, and I was around with all these experts and scholars all the time, so I really know about what's, what's there. So yeah. it's not just the stone, but everything has its own story behind it. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And from the story, you develop it into something that greatness mm. of like the king, for example. Uh, you always explain between the temple, the life of the temple, the lifestyle there, and behind the scenes, what was going on, you know. So you get people all the imagination, like they never heard that story before. Yes, they sir. read the book, they read the guidebook, they read the newspaper, they watch the documentary. But it's not like But when they get to you, you always to yeah, you yeah. always learn more beside what what uh, what's said in the book.